How frequently do patients ask you for help in dying? Well, I've been practicing as, as a consultant for 14 years, and I can remember in that time three people who have actually outright asked me if I can help them to end it all or whatever phrase they use. And what did you do? Well, different situations. Um, in none of those situations did I help them. Uh, we talked about um, what the issues were that were troubling them and tried to make contact with them on a, on a whole range of issues, trying to explore about their life wider than their cancer, seeing what it was that was really upsetting them and asking them to request that. And actually in all three situations that the request evaporated, um, so they didn't pursue it uh, as they thought through various other issues and as they received the benefits of the whole team looking after their different needs. Some people argue that palliative care is a better alternative than assisted dying. But this isn't just about pain, is it? For many people, it's about the loss of control, it's about the loss of dignity, and no amount of palliative care can solve that. What do you say to those people? Perhaps I can tell you about one of my three examples. He was a, a gentleman just uh, retired. He'd been a, a golf professional, and he had lung cancer and he'd had um, developed spinal cord compression so he was paralyzed from the waist downwards and his breathing was difficult because of his lung cancer and he was really frustrated and depressed because he, he got out of breath quickly, he couldn't move and he really felt that there was nothing more to his life and he, so he asked me uh, to end it all. And we sat down and, and we talked about the situation and um, as a golf professional he was still living in his tired accommodation and his wife was there and when he died she would have nowhere to live so actually he had a really important issue to sort out there which he could still do even though he couldn't walk and he couldn't um, do the things he used to do and we talked some more and he had a son who'd had a very bad accident to his arm and he hadn't actually been in touch with that son for a few years and he, he realized that he really wanted to restore that relationship so what, what happened to him was that he, he realized that he had actually some really important jobs to do which only he could do. Nobody else could resolve these things. And suddenly his life took on a new meaning. And even though he still had the shortness of breath and the incapacity, um, he realized that he had lots to do. And, and so he decided, well, he changed his mind. So I think that sort of way of actually it, it was the dignity thing that was really uh, upsetting him. And it's my experience that if you address that, then uh, people can begin to relate as a person again and see their whole human dignity in a different perspective. There seems to be some confusion about where doctors stand on this issue of the bill. Certainly the Royal College of Physicians and the British Medical Association have now moved into a position of neutrality. Where do oncologists, people in your field, stand? Yeah, well, in my own hospital, um, I've spoken to my colleagues and, and we're uniformly against it. We're, there are 17 oncologists in my hospital and um, none of us would like to see the law changed. The palliative care physicians have done a poll and 95% of them were against. Geriatricians, 91% against a change in the law. So as when you deal, ask doctors who are closely involved with dying patients, the vast majority of them are against a change in the law. Why do you think that is? I think for the reasons that I've explained really that actually we see that with good care uh, we can resolve so many of these the issues that people are frightened about and a lot of it is about fear what people are afraid they don't see death in the normal everyday life it's tucked away in hospitals and yet those of us who do see people dying and see I think also the tremendously important conversations that people have when in those last few days, as they are reconciled to the fact that they're dying, sometimes the most amazing and important conversations can be held between a dying mother and her children or those sort of situations. And we see the value of that. And we see that people, many people, achieve that a sort of peace. Um, and so there are many positive things um, that can happen in those last days. Why do you think it is that overwhelmingly public opinion supports assisted dying? I think that it relates to that issue that I've mentioned, that people are 
um, do not see death. So it's a, a black, fearful thing. Um, and when we sit in our comfortable, healthy lives and we see somebody very ill, um, we think, well, if I was like that, I would rather be dead. But actually what I see in clinical practice is that people move from a position of health to a position of being terminally ill through a series of steps of adjustments. And actually people, those are hard steps. But as they adjust, they learn to value their life even though it gets increasingly restricted and difficult. Um, and I think people, healthy people actually don't see very much of that and so are not really aware of the way people adjust to increasing ill health. They just see it as something they don't want, uh, they'd rather not be there, they wouldn't um, do it to their dog, all of these phrases, uh, which are largely out of lack of experience, I think. Finally, how will your relationship with your patients change if this bill is passed? I think it would bring in a different dimension. It would bring in a, a sort of threat to the vulnerable. Um, I know that there has been a lot of effort to try and minimise that threat by the provisions of the law, but it will fundamentally change the practice of medicine if doctors are enabled to prescribe lethal medications.